Hello there, students. My name is Dr. Marty Pants. That's Dr. I actually go by S. Marty Pants. And uh, I always like to say, it's nice to meet you. And I'm sorry that I'm so much smarter than you. <laughs> that was one of my, my own jokes there. Um, I was actually one of Mr. Miller's students for a year because I graduated from middle school so quickly. But uh, what a great time I had. I was one of his favorite students. Isn't he something? And Mr. Miller, what a guy. I am very uh, fond of Mr. Miller. Um, I, too, was once a middle school student like yourselves. Um, here's actually a picture of myself. You can see uh, I was uh, obviously quite, quite popular with the ladies. <clears throat> I don't like to brag. But now I am actually a doctor. And I know a lot. And I know a lot about DNA. So Mr. Miller asked me to come in and give you guys a little refresher. So I'm going to go ahead and present a, a PowerPoint lesson to you. Please pay attention. We'll begin with a little videotape that gives a little backup information about DNA. Now Mr. Miller may have taught you some of this, but I will teach it excellently. Please take notes on all the movies, including this one. You can uh, write notes in the margins. Living things are very diverse and are found in an incredible array of colors, shapes, and sizes. Yet in spite of their great differences, if you look closely enough, they are actually quite similar to one another. As long ago as the 1830s, Scientists had begun to realize this fact when they discovered that all living things are made from cells. By the middle of the 20th century, even more similarities were found when new scientific tools let researchers examine the molecules found inside of cells. One molecule in particular, called deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, captured their attention. Scientists discovered that DNA uses a genetic code to chemically store the information cells need to perform their many life-supporting activities. Researchers also discovered that this genetic code is truly universal because it is used in every living cell from lowly bacteria like these to the complex cells of animals and plants. Now let us learn more about the amazing DNA molecule and find out how it works. All right, well, wasn't that special movie? Hope you all took notes. This next slide shows um, two dashing young fellows. Uh, this is Watson and Crick. Uh, Watson and Crick were the ones who uh, figured out the shape of the DNA molecule. They actually won a Nobel Prize. <laughs> I've got a couple. <laughs> but uh, they were pretty smart, too. They figured out that the DNA was in a twisted ladder. This was very special, as you know, because of the way that DNA makes copies of itself. It has information and can make an identical copy of itself. They figured out that it was a double helix shape. That's actually the name of my dog. <laughs> Come here, double helix. Good boy. Chromosomes. DNA is actually packaged up in chromosomes. Really, a chromosome is just a strand of DNA, but it's wound around proteins. It's all packaged up like a little Christmas package. Make sure to take notes. In the cells of higher organisms, almost all the DNA is located inside the nucleus in the substance called chromatin. Before a cell reproduces, the chromatin changes into the separate structures seen here that are known as chromosomes. Inside a chromosome, the DNA, along with some proteins, is neatly packaged. It is twisted and folded over and over again. Something like this is possible because DNA is a very large molecule a macromolecule. A closer look shows that the DNA molecule is actually made up of two separate strands that wind around and around one another, 
creating a shape called a double helix. Each of the DNA strands is made up of smaller chemical subunits called nucleotides, which are joined together one after another in a very precise order. And now, just what are genes? Genes are, you know, they're passed on from one generation to the next. That means you get your genes from your parents. <laughs> I don't mean Jordache genes. <laughs> and you don't know what those are. Um, a type of gene, never mind. They have to be copied exactly each time. If there's ever a mistake, it can be a problem because there's information on your genes. They contain the information to build cell parts, determine what something looks like. They're found on your DNA. They're sections of DNA, actually. Uh, go ahead and watch this video of someone who's not quite as smart as me, but also very smart. Don't forget to take notes. In the last century, researchers studying genes, the units of heredity, which determine such things as hair color, eye color, and blood type, made two extremely important discoveries. The first was that genes are made from DNA. The second was that each gene holds the coded instructions for making a different protein. It's down in my notes if I was you, but then uh, what do I know? Oh, that's right. I'm a genius. Each chromosome in a cell has many different genes. And genes themselves are simply certain regions of a DNA molecule. Genes determine the order amino acids will appear in a particular protein chain. And it is this order which gives the protein the ability to do its job. Now let us see how DNA stores instructions in the unique biological language of the genetic code. Well, I hope you took lots of notes on that. Here is another video is going to be coming up. Mr. Miller has tons of videos on this. Lots of possibilities for points. DNA is parts. DNA is made up of nucleotides. The nucleotides. I like to say that. Say it with me. Nucleotides. They're these little small pieces or smaller pieces that make up the larger, very large DNA molecule. You can see them here. They're made up of a phosphate, a sugar molecule, deoxyribose, and a nitrogen base. Each nucleotide has these three things. Go ahead and watch this little video clip and be sure to take notes. Only four different subunits are used in DNA, but each one can be found tens of thousands of times in the huge molecule. To help visualize molecules, scientists use structural formulas like this one to show how their atoms are bonded together. For example, this structural formula shows that each DNA subunit contains a phosphate group composed of a single atom of the element phosphorus, P, bonded to four atoms of the element oxygen, O, plus a single hydrogen atom, H. Each DNA subunit also contains a sugar group called deoxyribose that is made from five carbon atoms, one oxygen atom, and several hydrogen atoms, all bonded together as shown here. The individual DNA subunits in a strand are linked together by strong chemical bonds between their phosphate and sugar groups. These bonds form the backbone of the DNA molecule. Each of the four DNA subunits possesses a nitrogen-containing base. Now then, here's another smart fellow, Shargoff. He's the one who actually realized or discovered that the amount of adenine matched exactly to the amount of thymine, and the amount of guanine matched exactly to the amount of cytosine. Now this is very important when Watson and Crick, remember those guys? These guys back here. When they discovered this shape, they realized that adenine matched with thymine and guanine matched with cytosine. And it was partly because of the numbers of these bases matching exactly. 
I understand Mr. Miller is still very musical. I still have that going through my head. Adenine with thymine, guanine with cytosine, da 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 da. I know. I'm surprised it hasn't gone a big, huge hit. In the 1950s, Chargoff discovered that A goes with T. You know that A is adenine, and T is thymine, and G, guanine, goes with cytosine. Here's a little bit more about DNA structure. If you'll notice this, these are molecules. Remember Mr. Miller had you build a molecule out of marshmallows and toothpicks? <laughs> that was very uh, entertaining, I'm sure, but it's not what a molecule really looks like. But here you can see, this is uh, how we scientists write and uh, show a model of a molecule. You can see DNA is actually each nucleotide is actually made up of different molecules connected together. So let's go ahead and watch the video and see more. The chemical names of the bases are thymine, cytosine, adenine, and guanine, abbreviated T, C, A, and G. These bases are always found in pairs linked to one another by weak chemical bonds called hydrogen bonds that exist between the bases in each strand. The bases always pair up the same way, so that if one DNA strand has an A, the opposite strand will always have a T in exactly the same place. Likewise, a G in one strand is always paired with a C in the same place in the opposite strand. Because of the way base pairing occurs, DNA molecules end up having two exactly opposite or complementary strands. As we will soon discover, it is the precise order the subunits appear in the DNA strands that is the key to the genetic code. And the genetic code is the key to life itself. Here's another video about the genetic code. It's how it works. It's kind of like an alphabet. Make sure to make note of how the DNA alphabet is like, but different from our alphabet. What would be the DNA letters? What would be the DNA code words? What would be a sentence of DNA? What would be a paragraph or maybe a book? The subunits of a DNA molecule, A, T, C, and G, are the four letters of the genetic code alphabet. Of course, the subunits are chemical compounds, not actual letters. Nevertheless, they can be used just like letters to spell out genetic code words. Most of the 64 code words used by living things represent or code for amino acids. And each of these words is only three letters long. For example, AAA is a code word for the amino acid phenylalanine, GCT for the amino acid arginine, CTC for glutamic acid, and TAC for the amino acid methionine. A protein made from these amino acids could have a gene or sentence of code words like this written in one of the DNA strands. This sentence informs the cell that this particular protein is to be made using only these four amino acids in this exact order. Okay, now here's a little bit of a quiz. Were you paying attention? Go ahead and answer these questions. You can read them right here. If you have problems with it, you can go back. You can actually watch the videos again. The information is right there in the reading and in the videos. So, do your best. It doesn't look like you need to do as complete sentences to me. Here's the second part of the questions. You can pause this video at will. So I'll pause it right now and go ahead and answer these questions. I've already answered them in my massive brain, but you try your best. Here's the next part. How does DNA replicate? Replicate is just a fancy word for making a copy. Replicate equals copy. So when I go to the copier, I replicate papers. <laughs> Watson and Crick also figured out how DNA replicates. Steps to replication. I understand Mr. Miller actually already had you do this. Is that true? 
and you do this with paper DNA. Well, uh, that's a good model, but DNA actually unwinds. You need to use a protein to do this. That protein is called a, an enzyme. And enzymes can be used for lots of different chemical reactions, and this is one of them. The latter unzips, and then new nucleotides come in and make new strands on both sides. Here's that first step. Here's a molecule of the enzyme helicase that actually unwinds the DNA. You can see the DNA strand being unwound right there. Then as it unwinds, these new nucleotides come in. See them coming into both sides and matching up? Boom, boom, boom. And we've got two identical strands of DNA. Only this shape could allow that to happen. The end result, we've got two identical strands. If we were able to, I'm not sure about this drawing, but if this was an accurate drawing, you'd be able to see identical, identical. Each one has half of the new strand from new nucleotides, and each one has half of the original one that was split. So this side's original, this side is new. Original, new. Ah, proteins. You gotta learn what proteins are for, because that uh, that's what DNA is for. DNA is all about making proteins. It has the information for it. Proteins are made up of long chains of amino acids of which there are 20 different kinds. Living organisms use proteins for a lot of different things. They can be used for building cell parts, repairing damage, fighting disease, and regulating the speed of the tens of thousands of chemical reactions that take place inside of cells. Be sure to take notes on all the movies. Did you take notes on that last one? If not, you can rewind it and watch it again. Protein synthesis making proteins. This is actually how it happens. A very simple version of it here. You'll see more when the video plays. DNA gets copied into mRNA. Then that goes out to the ribosome, which reads it. Every three bases is a codon, which is like a code word. Remember the alphabet example? A codon would be like a code word tRNA, or transfer RNA, then adds in the amino acids. The movie will explain a lot. Be sure to take notes and actually draw pictures to help. Inside living cells, the actual process of making proteins involves several different steps because the instructions for making proteins are stored in the nucleus but the proteins themselves are made or synthesized in the cytoplasm. This means cells must have a way to move information out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm. As it turns out, cells use a special molecule for this task called messenger RNA. RNA, or ribonucleic acid, is very similar to DNA but RNA has only a single strand. It contains the sugar ribose instead of deoxyribose, and a base called uracil replaces the thymine found in DNA. So the RNA alphabet is A-U-C-G, not the A-T-C-G used by DNA. Whenever a cell needs more of a certain protein, it sends a chemical signal to the nucleus, which causes the gene for that protein to be switched on. When this happens, the DNA code words in the gene are copied into the RNA code words, or codons, of messenger RNA. This process is called genetic transcription. After the gene is copied, the messenger RNA carries the protein-making instructions to a ribosome in the cytoplasm. Ribosomes are the organelles where proteins are made. However, just the fact that the messenger RNA has reached a ribosome is not enough for the protein to start being made.
in order for the message to be translated, a third kind of RNA, called transfer RNA, is needed. Transfer RNAs are small RNA molecules that can pick up amino acids and transfer them to the messenger RNA on the ribosome. There are almost as many transfer RNAs as there are DNA code words. In fact, each of the different transfer RNAs has a different anticodon, which is basically a DNA code word written using the letters of the RNA alphabet. Transfer RNAs carrying amino acids match up their anticodons to the messenger RNA codons as the ribosome moves along the message. As a result, the amino acids carried by the transfer RNAs will be put into the protein chain in exactly the right order. Once the protein is finished, it is ready to perform its job in the cell. And as the protein goes to work, a new chemical signal is sent back to the nucleus that switches off the gene for that particular protein. Transcription. Transcription is when a strand of mRNA messenger RNA is made. So this is that first part of this. This is when the mRNA is made. It's called transcription. So it's made from one gene, because we're only making one protein made from this gene. The DNA molecule is split, but only at that gene. Then new bases come in and line up with the old bases one at a time as the DNA is unzipped. There's something else that's a little bit different here. Here's the differences. In replication, we end up making an identical copy. In transcriptions, it's not identical. It's a single-stranded mRNA molecule. Instead of being a double-stranded, like a ladder, this is like half a ladder. Also, you'll see that uracil is a new base and it actually matches up with adenine. So thymine is out. Goodbye thymine. Bulk. And we bring in uracil. The RNA alphabet is A U C G instead of A T C G. Uh oh, I think we have a new song. Adenine with uracil, cytosine with guanine. Not quite as catchy as Mr. Miller's. Instead of the sugar deoxyribose, we have ribose. Get it? R for ribose in RNA instead of DNA. RNA. Get it? Protein synthesis. So after that, first we had to make that molecule of mRNA, the message. And then it goes outside of the nucleus to a ribosome. So we've got our mRNA that was done during transcription. Mm -hmm. Then the mRNA codon the piece of mRNA with a code goes to a ribosome. Actually, a codon would be just a section of this mRNA, every three bases, actually. At the ribosome, pieces of tRNA, transfer RNA, bring in amino acids to the ribosome, and they match them up. Each transfer RNA matches up to only one amino acid, and it brings in and matches it up just right on the mRNA. And they assemble them together, one after the other, just like in that video clip you saw. And a string of amino acids makes a protein. Okay, here's another quiz, guys. Good luck. Uh-oh, this doesn't look like fill in the blank. This looks like sentences. Don't forget. Number two doesn't look like sentences. It looks like it could just be a single answer. What are genes? This definitely. What does um, adenine pair up with in RNA? Oh, RNA. Make sure you get that right. What are the steps of protein synthesis? Hmm. After DNA replication, what are we left with? Hmm. Sounds like it's going to need some sentence here, real explanation. Maybe even some drawings would be good. What part do enzymes play in DNA replication and transcription? Hmm, I remember an enzyme called helicase. That's all, folks. Make sure you can watch this again if you need to.
and to get all of the notes and make sure you answer all the questions. Don't forget notes on all the movies.